I'm not required to sort of referee this debate. I think Andrew's doing that. But I, I just wanted to give you my perspective on what's happened and what's gone well and what's not gone so well. Um, and I'll do that uh, as rapidly as I can. I, I wanted to start by just sort of suggesting that there are broadly three narratives of understanding the relationship between the sector and the state and where we are. Uh, one I won't dwell on because I think it's, it's uh, nobody, uh, nobody really advances it now. Uh, and the other two I want to dwell on a little bit more uh, and assess the government in relation to the narrative that they are principally pinning to uh, at the moment. Uh, the first, which I won't spend any time on, but did feature mainly from about 45 to the mid-70s, was the notion of voluntary sector as exemplar. You know, we actually did good things, rather interesting things, and we persuaded the state to do similar things. And uh, uh, that was basically what underpinned Beveridge's voluntary action report, the idea that we were much more marginal now that the state had arrived uh, and that our responsibility was to do interesting things and persuade the state to do innovative things, the notion of innovation. Uh, the other two perspectives I think are more pertinent to this debate, uh, one of which I think featured particularly prominently at the beginning of New Labour, which was essentially a debate about the notion of partnership between the state and the sector in terms of the delivery of particular uh, programmes. Uh, and you got a whole raft of initiatives uh, as a result of that. You've got the compact, you've got legal changes, tax changes, um, uh, partnership ways of working. There was a sort of deterioration, I think, towards the end of the Labour government that uh, partnership was almost uh, defaulting into a, a principally a contractual set of relationships and where one party would determine for the other what that they were required to do. But I think the notion of partnership between the state and the sector was very prominent. You got the compact inevitably developing there, which was, a, if you like, an articulation of that partnership relationship. And part of that, I think, was a fairly strong architecture within the central government to actually look at this uh, with significant uh, programme funding, uh, as well as uh, ministers that were clearly on the up escalator because they're now leading the Labour Party. Um, the, uh, the third example, if you like, is if you like the big society narrative. Um, and the big society narrative, I think, was a change, a shift from the partnership narrative. It was more about uh, seeing a smaller state uh, and, a, uh, and, a, and a more thriving uh, civil society. I think the big society stuff is uh, interesting. Uh, there is no such thing as uh, society. We remember who articulated that view to a position was there is such a thing as society, it's just not the same as the state. Trying to simultaneously distance yourself from, uh, if you like, a Thatcherite position, but also the big state position that had been associated with the outgoing Labour government. So that was the big society. So I'm not going to express a view about which of these narratives I find most appealing, because it seems to me that that would be straying into uh, ideological uh, positions, which of course I never <coughs> take. Uh, the, <laughs> what, I, what I would say is I'm going to measure, uh, if, and of course these aren't hermetically sealed. You'll find elements of these across different political programmes. You'll find a, a bit of partnership in the government's proposals. You'll find a bit of big society, if you like, in, 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 the, in the previous government's uh, encouragement of philanthropy. Uh, but I, I, I'm going to sort of measure... Uh, the government's achievements or lack of achievements, depending on how you look at it, in terms of the big society narrative. If the intention was to change the balance between civil society and the state, how well have they succeeded in doing that? Well, they set out to do it. It took us a while to work out what big society actually meant in terms of public, actual practical policy. Uh, but if we look at it broadly, eventually you can see them falling into three areas, and those are the areas that I want to assess. Um, I'll then go on to take a side swipe at Labour, but I won't do that till the end. The, um, <laughs> the, uh, the three elements of their, uh, of, their pub of their policy to deliver this big society narrative were social action, localism and opening up public services. Simple as that, really. So let me take a look at each of those in turn. Social action, I think some uh, developments uh, for the better. Everybody's suggested that National Citizen Service has been a net contributor, and I would concur with that view. I think that uh, having a program where people of a particular age have the opportunity to work with each other in voluntary action is a good thing. Uh, the only criticisms I've heard of that were twofold. 
Uh, one of which was it may be pitched at slightly the wrong age because people are currently doing their O-levels at that point. Uh, and the second was that there wasn't much follow-on. There was nowhere for people to sort of go and get involved in community voluntary action as a result of this experience. I think probably as the pilots are assessed uh, and uh, the scaling up which is now going on takes place, that probably needs to be uh, uh, probably needs to be addressed. Of course, uh, every government has a volunteering initiative. This is true in this country, and it's also true in the United States. You can wander around Washington and find the last volunteering initiative that a president had. Uh, they normally have small offices because they don't have any money anymore, but they don't disappear. Um, uh, and uh, so, no doubt, uh, we'll find V popping up again somewhere and the other initiatives. So that there is a, there's a genuine desire, I think, to encourage volunteering, and I think the NCS is as good as any uh, in relation to this. Community First, I think, has proved to be good. The endowment matching is a continuation of, a for, of the former government's policy. I thoroughly approve of endowment matching because I think it encourages the building of community assets, uh, which I think somebody asked me uh, a few months ago from the OCS, what, what, what did I think was... Given all the golden age that we'd all spouted on about the previous 10 years, what did I think had been missing from that? And I thought, basically, it was that we didn't really think about sustainability. Uh, we thought about, uh, there's a contract, let's have a go for it, let's expand, etc., etc. But we didn't really pay much attention to how sustainable this was. And because we became more influenced by public spending changes, because there was more public money, we therefore suffered more uh, as a result of changes in public funding. We didn't think about sustainability. So I think endowment funds are great, and I think it's a great extension of what went on before. Social Action Fund, I think, is interesting because it does put some money into innovation around philanthropy, and the Innovation and Giving Fund does the same. Tax changes, which is, of course, part of setting the environment for philanthropy, which is a key uh, part of trying to increase uh, independence from the state, if you like, more civil society, less government. Well, it's a mixed picture, isn't it? I mean, the small charity stuff, I think, is good. I'd like to see the cap further up. Talking of caps, uh, I'd like to see that further up. I'd like to see the level of donation that that was fixed at slightly higher. Um, and I think the stuff on inheritance tax, the jury is still out on whether that will have an impact. Of course, the great disaster we're seeing is the tax cap in relation to high-level philanthropy. I won't go into that. It's been well rehearsed. Um, I think... Uh, uh, I think it was uh, it demonstrated a number of things, one of which is that the architecture of government is insufficiently tuned to the needs of the voluntary sector. My own view is that nobody deliberately sets out to harm the charitable sector, but they do it in passing. The last government did it with advanced corporation tax in relation to foundations, and this government has done it in relation to philanthropy for high-level donors. So I'd like to see the Chancellor change his view on that. Uh, we have a high level of expectation. So there we are in relation to social action, a mixed picture. Uh, generally, I think more could be done in terms of the tax regime. Uh, more could be done in terms of encouraging giving. My view is that even at the, the biggest driver, philanthropy, will not get to a stage where it can begin to compensate for reductions in the levels of public spending that have been lost to the sector. That's quite a tall order and a difficult ask. Uh, second, era, uh, uh, localism. Um, I think the asset transfer stuff in the localism bill has potential. Uh, I think that um, uh, it's, uh, it, it is a difficult area. Do communities have both the capability, resources and technical skills in order to begin to do this? I think the jury's out, but I think it's, it's, got, it's promising. Community organisers is interesting. I mean, people are talking about them for the first time I can remember for the last 18 months. They've dropped off my radar. I don't actually know what's happening. Um, but it may well be that something's happening and I just don't know about it. But I, I don't, I, it's not featuring high up the community organiser stuff and I'd like to see a little bit more evaluation in that area about what the intention is and to be able to demonstrate whether or not this has worked or not. Finally, uh, on public services. Uh, this, I think, is the third broad area about opening up public services. The open services white paper, very helpful. 
and useful. Contract readiness fund, also very helpful. But actually developing in an odd way, which I don't think is necessarily advantaging civil society or the voluntary sector. And I think there are significant policy changes that are required in that area. If you look across the board, uh, I won't focus on all the areas. Clearly the area which is often not mentioned but where the greatest expansion has taken place in the role of civil society is in education. The expansion of the academies programme has been the most significant development in relation uh, to this and goes rather unsung. Uh, criminal justice is beginning to happen. There are issues there. We'll talk a little bit about health and care. Uh, obviously we had the uh, rather interesting discussions about the future of the health and social care bill and the role of voluntary organisations thing. I think the jury's out on whether clinical commissioning will actually lead to greater or less voluntary organisation involvement in the provision of health care or greater or less integration of that services. But the one that uh, as mentioned is in relation to the work programme, which is a walking disaster as far as voluntary organisations are concerned. Why? <laughs> because there are two issues operating here. One is that the contracts were based on scale. Voluntary organisations cannot operate at that scale and therefore were unable to become intimately involved in delivery. And in terms of subcontracting, which is the market that has developed, there have been two uh, essential uh, problems. One is referrals haven't come through at the rate that was expected. And second and most important, you really have to reform the payment by results system in relation to this. You have to change the cash flow because voluntary organisations do not have the working capital to be able to operate in that environment. That is why they're pulling out of these programmes. So there you are. Oh, well, I'm nearly finished. I'm going to hit myself. Um, um, uh, one area which I haven't mentioned but has been mentioned before, which I think will be the residual uh, uh, will, will be an important part of how we view this government, indeed view the previous government, is the development of the social investment market. Still at a very early stage. I think there's broad bipartisan support for the development of that market. I think it's interesting to see how quickly that market uh, will develop. The government, I think, made the right choice in devoting all of the unclaimed assets uh, to develop that market. The previous government rightly set out how they were going to do this, but were, there was a debate about how much of the unclaimed assets would go into this as against youth services. Uh, so I'm rather pleased. And I think Nick uh, Hurd uh, did, has nailed his colours to the mast in relation to the development of the social investment market, and I broadly welcome uh, the way in which uh, that is developing. I think we need to see how it will develop. But even if it only reaches over 10, 15 years, 2 billion or something of that nature, that will have been a remarkable achievement against the 20 billion or so philanthropy and the 20 billion or so government grants uh, and contracts. But of course this is a back against the backdrop of a sector uh, which grew on the basis of significant public service contracts and is therefore declining on the decline of those public service uh, contracts. Uh, and that uh, yeah, there's a certain issue there about the extent to which you might have wanted to advantage voluntary action in that particular environment uh, in this particular climate. On Labour, uh, Labour is, of course, the opposition, and the role of an opposition is to oppose uh, uh, effectively, and I think their opposition, as we've just heard, has been pretty effective. Uh, what I don't get yet, and I think it's probably early days, uh, that's what uh, I think will be said, is I don't, I don't yet know what alternative narrative Labour is putting in place yet. Uh, is it a return to a sort of partnership agenda? Is it a sort of derivative of a big society agenda which focus on mutuals and co-ops when Morris Glassman was appointed as the uh, 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 was it a blue Tory or a red, I can't remember that's wrong, a, a red, no he wasn't a red Tory, it was a blue Labour wasn't it? Um, uh, about whether or not there was a new, was a new uh, emphasis on mutuality and cooperation as, as an alternative to traditional state provision, but I don't see that narrative yet developing, but I think we probably will as we near the next election. Thanks very much. Thank you. <clears throat>